All right, so uh, my name's Falco Gerges. Um, I did my present, these are props, all you can hear. I did my presentation on an FPGA implementation of the visual memory unit for the Sega Dreamcast. You're probably wondering what that is. Um, the year 1999, the greatest game console on the planet came out, the Sega Dreamcast. Um, with it came the visual memory unit, which is the memory card for this thing right here. They came in different colors. And they served a few different purposes. One is they could display extra data while you're playing the game. Like it, it was a second screen, so if you're playing like a card game, you could hide your card, you know. And then they stored, uh, they stored your save files on them. And then some games, the really good games, had extra mini games where you could offload uh, these other games onto this little thing and play standalone games like Pac-Man and other. They're just little games. It's not, very, it's not a very capable system. And then uh, some of the games let you link them up and fight them, like this is what we did in like elementary school, under the desk, and uh, <laughs> a trade files and stuff. Basically, it was amazing. Um, so I mentioned uh, at the beginning of class that I was working on a Kickstarter game called Elysian Shadows. Um, well, this game targets a bunch of different platforms, and one of the main ones that we were funded for is the Dreamcast. So in order to be a decent Dreamcast game and to appeal to the Dreamcast backers, we have to have uh, basically VMU extras for the Dreamcast version. But one of the problems is we're already late and how do we uh, justify these Dreamcast extras for the other platforms and people who you know, bought the game for their iPhone or for Steam or something like that. And then if we don't have them, the people on the Dreamcast will feel cheated. So what we initially did, and that's what this is, I'm sorry, I'm actually going to pass this around to, um, it's got a game on it, and the batteries may or may not be dying. Uh, it's the same game right here that's on the actual hardware. Uh, first, I developed a, a software emulator called uh, Elysian VMU. That's what this is, and it, it lets basically any platform, like your PC, your smartphone, anything like that, work as a visual memory unit, and the hardware is fully emulated, so the same game that we write a little 8-bit assembly for the Dreamcast can be played everywhere else. So we're not like screwing backers out of, uh, out of content. Um, so we wanted to take it one step further and that's where the FPGA came in. And we wanted to actually create hardware. Um, there's a lot of room for improvement on this thing and there's a lot of complaints. Uh, the battery life really sucks. It doesn't hold that much data. The screen resolution is tiny. It has no backlight. There's no color. So there's a lot of cool stuff you could do with it. Uh, you could give it a new architecture that's 16-bit. You could uh, basically something like this. This is a mock-up, you know, of a decked out one that can play MP3s. And uh, one like this, maybe it could interact with the PC as like a storage device. So it's not just specific to the Dreamcast so other people can buy it. So the beginning of that is what this project is. Um, this is the block diagram of the uh, original. And so the first thing I need to do is be fully backwards compatible. So the first thing I, I'm doing on the FPGA is basically trying to implement this thing in an FPGA. So this is the block diagram of the entire thing. I didn't do the entire thing for the scope of this class, but it's pretty close and it's not quite playable yet, but it's almost there. The main chip on it is called the potato. Get it? Potato chip like this. Yeah, <laughs> that would be funny. Um, so it has a CPU core. It has a... Uh, ROM inside of it, it has flash, RAM, um, LCD driver. What I implemented was the CPU core, the ROM, the flash, the RAM, and the uh, XRAM, which is the video RAM, but I don't actually have it connected to uh, display, which would probably be trivial, but I just ran out of time. And I have the I.O. ports from like the, uh, the buzzer and the buttons. They're actually there, they're just not going to anything, so it's not quite playable, even though the, uh, the CPU can execute code or games, you just can't really see anything. Um, the first thing that I had to do uh, architecturally in VHDL is reproduce the memory space, which for this, it was really a pain in the butt. So, because um, it has so many things it can do. The memory space is disjoint in this thing. Um, the ROM here is what has the BIOS, that's the built-in code for like, uh, when you turn it on, it already has like a built-in clock and file manager, that's in ROM. And then in Flash is where your save files are and uh, optional games that you put on here. So these are like user mode games, then this is like the, the built-in OS stuff provided with it. And then separate from that is RAM, which is divided into two banks, and then Flash is divided into two banks to complicate it. 
And uh, so this is not a von Neumann architecture because there's a separate uh, instruction address space from the data address space, which kind of makes it more of a pain in the butt. And if you'll notice, this is an 8-bit processor and the size of this ROM and flash means that it needs a 9-bit address space. So you have an 8-bit word and 9-bit address space, that, which made it more of a pain in the butt. So in VHDL, basically, I know this is really ugly, but to do the memory space, I have basically a giant array of uh, standard logic vectors that, um, using the concurrent assignment statements, are being mapped to different locations. So this top stuff is for the data. And you can see I'm memory mapping the first block into uh, RAM bank 0 or 1, depending on a control register. Uh, for here, uh, that's another piece of RAM being mapped, depending on a control register. This is the display memory, which is divided into three banks, depending on which uh, control register is active. And then uh, this is another portion of display memory. And then this is doing it for the instruction memory, which you can see, depending on the value of that EXT register, selects whether you're executing instructions from memory or from ROM, which would be like the system BIOS stuff, or from Flash, which would be like the user space games. Um, so the next big thing was the CPU. Uh, it's a little 8-bit Sanyo LC86K87, very uh, obscure CPU that was really hard to find data sheet and information on. Uh, it's a little 8-bit CPU that could have been used in like a DVD player or something like that. Um, this is basically what it had built in. Uh, and pretty much I did everything. I didn't do the timer, so any game that depends on uh, specific timing doesn't work. I didn't actually do the controller for LCD, but I did all the video memory stuff so that could be mapped later on. Um, and I didn't do the serial interface, which is used for the two talking together and uh, talking to the actual console when it's being used inside the controller. Um, this is the instruction map for the CPU, and if you'll notice, this is really a pain in the butt. Um, these are not the same size instructions. They're not the same size, and they're not even the same size opcodes. Like, the opcode for no op is 8 bits, while the opcode for this thing is like only 4 bits, so that complicates it even more. And the instruction size of some of these is 3 bytes, while the instruction size for some of the other ones is 1 byte, so it's not like it it mapped simply to like a, like a record or anything. It's actually really, really annoying. Um, so the first thing I did is uh, I wanted to create like a, a lookup table that uh, had all the information on each instruction, like the opcode and everything. Uh, I made a, a, an enumeration for all the different types of arguments that the instructions have. And then this is called the uh, instruction attribute, which has the opcode. It has the different operands the instruction takes. It can have up to three of them. Has the number of bits in the opcode, the number of cycle or bytes for the total instruction, the number of cycles the instruction takes. That, and I can use that in the CPU later on. And then I had to construct a massive, gigantic uh, lookup table uh, that spans the whole memory map um, for every opcode. So this is just a small example. This is the no op, this is branch, this is load. This is load indirect, and those are the attributes that can be referenced later um, in the CPU logic. Uh, the CPU core logic is basically uh, it's a cascaded process that happens in this order. So first, there's a clock process which upgrades the, updates the program counter or checks if there's a reset signal, and then initializes all the special function registers and uh, the program counter and all that. And then once the PC changes, that that triggers a fetch of instruction. Once the instruction or opcode changes, that triggers the extraction of operands. And then once the operands changes, there's a, there's a special step I'll get into, which is for the memory indirect mode that uh, fetches that pointer. And then once that's done, it, it triggers the actual instruction execution. So it's not, it's not necessarily like a traditional model like you've learned in uh, architecture class where it's a five-stage pipeline. This is not a pipeline processor. But that is how it was easiest to break the logic up from like a behavioral standpoint. Um, fetch instructions, since I said the largest one is three bytes, I basically have a standard, a 24-bit standard logic vector that every uh, every clock cycle is just uh, 
pointing to the in instruction memory, the next 24 bytes, and whether the instruction is actually 24 bytes, or sorry, I keep saying bytes, 24 bit or 8 bit, doesn't matter. You only look at what you need. So uh, this is just here to protect against uh, going outside of the range of the instruction space. Um, so first it's, it's grabbing the instruction from instruction memory and then it's, it's extracting the opcode um, from instruction memory, which can then be, uh, or it's extracting the opcode from the instruction, which can be used later. Um, extracting operands uh, is another step that's going on. Uh, basically, it's looking at the instruction and it's pulling out the different operands that the CPU and ALU will need le uh, later. So it's the operands and how they work are determined by the address modes, and there are two different cases, and I have no idea why they did it this way, and I'm gonna punch someone. Because it's really annoying to implement this, but there are instructions that are not encoded like any other instruction, and it's annoying, and there just basically has to be a special uh, case for, okay, if it's this instruction, these bits are packaged exactly like this. Like one of them isn't contiguous, one of the, uh, one of the operands is four bits with one bit of another operand in the middle for these instructions. I have no idea why they did that. And then other than that, uh, the standardly encoded instructions, I'm just basically looping over the, uh, the number, of, uh, number of operands which I have from that instruction map, map I showed you, and then I can look at the operand types and, and uh, extract them. These are the different addressing modes, which are relevant to how the operands are extracted. There's immediate, direct, indirect, bit specifier, absolute, and relative. This is the number of bits they are. Immediate is pretty obvious. It's in the instruction itself. Direct is uh, basically a memory address inside the instruction. Indirect is a huge pain. I'll get into it later. That's basically like a pointer loading a pointer that's in memory pointing to another address, bit specifiers for doing things like clearing one bit, and then absolute and relative are uh, for branching conditional logic. Uh, this, is, this is a look at the general purpose uh, operand extraction logic. Like I said, uh, it's a loop of up to uh, three different operands for the largest instruction. And it's saying, uh, it's looking at the type of the operands based on the opcode from that giant lookup table that I made. And it's saying, okay, if this is a relative eight opcode, then it's extracting it into this uh, ops is a, is a record of the different operands that are extracted. So it's just extracting each operand there. So the register indirect operand is a massive pain in the butt, and this comes from the fact that you have an 8-bit architecture that a memory address is 9 bits, so how do you actually represent a pointer since it can't fit in one, uh, can't fit into one word on the processor. So the way it works is uh, you are packing, there are special memory addresses which are hard-coded pointer addresses. You can only store, okay, you can only store pointers in one of four different addresses. And then in one of those four, you're only, you're only storing the, the first byte of the pointer in those special addresses. And then the second byte of the pointer, or the, the ninth byte, I keep saying byte, I mean bit, you guys know that right. The ninth bit of the pointer comes from uh, the instruction itself and which register you use. So it's kind of a pain. And that's the, that's the logic for doing it, for uh, taking bits seven, zero to seven from the memory address and then bit eight from the instruction itself. And then execute instruction, which was in the C version, was the heart of everything, was actually weirdly easy in VHDL. I left this for the very end because I had to have the whole architecture done first and I thought I'd be up for like three days straight working on it, but actually I wasn't. This is like looking at the actual core and how it's uh, implemented. Basically, for each opcode, this is the action that's being taken. You see, for branching, it does that. And uh, there's only one more slide. I just wanted to show that in that scenario, the first one is how it was implemented in C, and the second one's VHDL. It actually simplified a lot of the design in VHDL, specifically the bit operations, because VHDL allows you to uh, access one bit at a time, whereas C requires all these uh, 
bit banging operations and things like that. So actually, it was easier to do in VHDL. Uh, this is the future work that we require just to get it playable. And uh, yeah, any questions? Yeah. So you you implemented mainly the CPU uh, of the that device. Uh, I implemented the CPU though, uh, the RAM, the flash, all the address space. So. It, it's, it's really a lot more than the CPU because you also have to implement the functionality of being able to fetch opcodes from either Flash or ROM and swap between them. Okay. There are... So you already had the source code for the program? Right. I wrote the emulator in C uh, like uh, last year. So I, I was already familiar with the architecture, already had the data sheets and things like that. So it was kind of a matter of translating from C to VHDL for me. Okay. Could you have picked a more simpler CPU so you could <coughs> compile it to run? You know how you explain all the yeah. difficulties you I have? mean, yeah, absolutely, but then I wouldn't be doing I mean, the whole goal was to create this device, you know what I mean, and to be... But you could implement the CPU in the FPGA, whatever the CPU wants. Correct. Right, but I'm not able to support the same programs and applications if I'm implementing another CPU. I, well, I need to be able to run all the games this can run, all the software this can run, and be compatible with it okay. at a binary level. So I do actually need to implement that CPU in the same instruction set. Simulation and synthesis results? Um, that was kind of a pain. I, I wish I had developed the test bench first. What I did is actually for each instruction I was implementing, I was hard-coded, hard -coded, uh, initializing uh, the first instruction in uh, instruction space to whatever instruction I was testing and looking at the signals in simulation where later after this I was working on a test bench to actually do that like for each opcode to test it uh, with automation and actually look okay did this add by looking at these addresses and stuff so while I was doing it it was a little more uh, rudimentary and if I'd known that I would have started with the test bench okay cool. save some time we need to move on okay thanks